Good morning. Good morning. Let us begin our worship this morning in the grace of our Lord Jesus who lived with us. Thank you all for coming this morning. I'm changing all. Good to see you here. It is communion this Sunday, so make sure you have your elements. We'll need them in a little while.
The Lord is our light and salvation. Whom shall we fear? With humble hearts, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Merciful God, you have made us citizens of heaven, but we confess that we have set our minds on earthly things. We have let our desire for security restrain our commitment to serve the poor. We have let our fear of danger curb our obligations to love our enemies. We have let our love of things develop our generosity to the needy. I will be made well. 
Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her, hand, took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the district. And then to John 6, 35 to 40, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. <coughs> this is the word of God. When I was a kid, we lived across from a park, and one of the things that I remember most clearly about my mother, who died when I was still a teenager, but I remember this about her for my whole life, was that she used to love to sit in her chair in the living room. It was by the window, and there was a radiator there, so it was nice and warm, and she loved to look out the window. And she would just sit there. I hate to say that she was a smoker, but she had her cigarette, her ashtray, her cigarette, the window, the, the radiator, and she was very comfortable just to sit there and to look out the window at the park. And I remember her and my grandmother who lived with us too, just talking a lot about the beautiful magnolia trees. Two, there were two trees right on the edge of the park in the dogwoods, and I inherited from my mother that love of the dogwoods. We must have a 15 in their yard. We have a lot of dogwoods. and just plant them when they're little and put them out there. And, um, and her love of looking out the window. It's a crazy thing about that, but whenever I go into my kitchen, I can't resist the temptation to walk over to the window and just stand there and stare out into the backyard. And I just look and look and Something about it, it's nice, I like to do it. But for the last several months, as I look out that window, my yard looks pretty sad. It, every winter is the same, it looks sad. Many plants are dead for the winter and others are listless. And there are a few large oaks that have some dead leaves hanging on them. But other than that, there's dead leaves on the ground and a few highs and rhododendron that have some green. But it's pretty sad. It's drab and blah and the grass is faded. I always feel like there's something I ought to be doing to fix this. But it is the way that it is. It's just not really very pretty out that window. And yet, recently, this is a crazy thing. I look at that dead yard and I go around saying to people, you've got to come over to my house and see my yard. Come in about two weeks. Come at the end of March or the beginning of April. My yard is gorgeous. You've got to see it. And I have to wonder, you know, why do I say that when it looks so bad? And I don't say this to get people to think that I have this lovely yard. But I say it because I know that it's going to be so pretty. And in my mind, I want others to see this. I have 
13 grandchildren, and I had this little granddaughter, and her name is Mirago. And she, she comes to my house last spring when great granddaddy died, and her mom and dad brought the family, and she, she was two years old. She got out of her car, and she stood, and all of those dog words were in bloom and disease. And she got out of her car two years old, and she just goes, oh. I know that this yard is a great experience for those couple of weeks. And so I want others to have that experience. And so I cannot resist telling people to come and to see my yard and wanting them to experience it. Which raises a question. I know my yard's going to look good. And at least I believe it's going to. I, mean, I know it's going to. <laughs> but how confident are we of Christ's resurrection and the hope that we that it offers? And how sure are we of the transforming power of God in our life? Does it compel us to invite people? to come, to experience this thing that we know that is so wonderful, this love of God. We know lots of people in trouble. Do we believe that Jesus can change their lives? I know that he changed mine. So I have to wonder, why am I so quick to see the beauty of God's creation out my window, and not the wonder of fellowship and worship or the hope of the resurrection. At least, maybe I see it, but why am I so quick to invite people to come and to see one, but not to come and to experience the other? In the scriptures, the Old and the New Testaments, we find many who because of what they heard and believed or what they experienced with God were compelled to act. We read of some today, the leader of the synagogue. He was so confident that Jesus could make it okay that even after his daughter died, he says, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Even after she had already died, he went to Jesus, knelt down and asked him to come. His faith brought him to action, and his action brought result. The woman who had been hemorrhaging for years thought, if only I can touch his garment. She didn't even believe she had to talk to Jesus. Just touch his garment. And she believed that she could be healed. She knew about Jesus. She heard about Jesus and his healings. If only she could just get that close to him. Her faith compelled her to act, and her action brought results. What about Jesus? What difference did confidence make and belief in Jesus in his own behavior? Jesus had much suffering to do, but he knew that glory followed suffering. He knew that when he was raised up, sin would be overcome, and that life would be for all who believe, would be eternal for all who believe. He came for a purpose. He believed that it would happen. It was not his will, but the Father's will. And that's where his confidence rested. Confident of the outcome, he stayed the course, even to death and this one who, though he was fully God, was flesh like us. Fully God, but fully human. He was convinced of his mission to be the bread of life, that we would not be hungry or thirsty, that we would have eternal life. Listen again for his confidence. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. Whoever believes will never be hungry. I say this to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me. And anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. Jesus is sure and confident of his purpose. And this confidence in the one who sent him is what drives him to fulfill his mission. He wants to do the Father's will. During this Lenten season, as we reflect on the cross, are we confident that after the cross comes the resurrection? But more than that, are we experiencing the power of the resurrection in our own lives so that we are living the resurrected life in such a way that we become more and more sure and confident of Christ's work. As I think about how beautiful my yard will be, and as I want to tell people to come and to see this, because it will be gone so quickly, I think about, what about Jesus? And the power of the cross and the resurrection. How special is that? Who do we not want to miss out on this hope for the broken, this life for the dead, this love for the unloved, this forgiveness for shame? I couldn't live without it, this love that embraces us and gives us hope. When we know it is so, it compels us to act. As we prepare our hearts this Lent season, as we prepare our hearts today to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to feast at the table, to receive the bread of life, this is a moment for us to consider what are we doing? Are we so confident in our faith that it brings us to action? Has their experience walking with God been transforming and life changing so that it compels us to act? If not, why not? What is missing? What might we need to address? One, maybe our confidence in what Christ has done is shaking. Maybe we really don't have it. What can we do? Read the Bible. Read the Gospels. Read what Jesus did. Read it again. Hear the story. It will reinforce your faith. Two, maybe our experience with God is actually very limited. We haven't had much experience with God. What can we do? Pray. Invite God to join near to us. Invite God, only if you want to, to change your life, to transform your life, to make it different. Three, maybe you've walked that walk and grown weary and distant. We do grow weary. Step away. Jesus did it often. He went away to the mountain. He went away to be with God. Even at the very end, he went into the garden. Go and get close to God. Step away. We do get weary, and you are not alone. And four, today is the Lord's Supper. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. This meal that Jesus established with his disciples. Jesus identified himself as the bread of life. Feast on this bread. You'll never grow hungry. You'll never be thirsty. Ask God to 
fill you. Amen.
How is a blessing for us? Thank you all. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Lord's table. Jesus welcomes those who trust in him, who believe in him as their Savior. Those who um, have been baptized, children who um, are in the church to come and to receive these gifts, the bread and the in the blood and body of Christ. Pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for the beauty of creation. For sending those of faith who acted on our behalf and your behalf. For the patriarchs and the judges and the prophets who came and proclaimed your ways, and when we didn't listen, and you knew that even now we wouldn't, we thank you for sending Christ, who came to do your will, to be for us the bread of life. Thank you for his obedience to suffer and to die, to overcome sin and death, to be raised from the dead, that we would not hunger or thirst, that all who believe would have eternal life. Gracious God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this cup. That the bread we break and the cup we bless might be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And by your Spirit, that you would unite us with the living Christ. And that all who are baptized in his name, that we might together be one in ministry in every place. And as this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Oh God, we pray this through Christ, with Christ and in Christ, together. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, and may all glory and honor be yours forever and ever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus was with his disciples at a meal, and after he blessed it, he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, This is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. When we see these gifts um, through our special cups, and I invite you now to open your cups so that we might partake together. Well, if you, the body of Christ given for you. blood of Christ poured out for the sin of the world. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for meeting us here at this table. 
for the blessings that you pour down on us, for the life you poured out. <coughs> we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah.